All right. Now, um, what I shall do today is <coughs> uh, to wrap up and underline <coughs> a few moments of uh, of the very simple model that I have uh, somewhat concluded and left uh, uh, aside. We are going to take over it and refer to it many times throughout the uh, remaining part of the course. As you will recall, this was a hububat economy, meaning that there is only one commodity which is both a consumption good and then investment good. Typically, classical economists had, uh, uh, had worked on this idea of one commodity, but it is very hard to uh, come up with a, a good that is both a bread and also machines. Uh, so this hububat, corn economy, solves that problem uh, very uh, conveniently. It is not an ad hoc uh, product. Otherwise, you have to deal with two goods, bread and machines. Then you have to deal with relative prices. So you have to deal with things like inflation, interest rate, today's prices, tomorrow prices. A lot of nuisance at this stage will, uh, will be on your, uh, on your way. In this economy, we said that uh, as an economist, we can think of two structural constraints. One, everything that is co uh, produced have to be either consumed or invested. That is, uh, production, supply, should be equal to aggregate demand. And aggregate demand has two components, consumption and investment. Government is missing, and there is no trade. So uh, that equation gives me the idea that one unit of corn is either consumed, little c is consumption per worker, and little, little l is amount of labor work per output. So this is total consumption. Plus, this economy is growing, and it is growing for one major reason, and it is people save and invest. That is, they do not consume part of the corn. That is, they save. And since there is no other thing uh, besides seeds, they save only on seeds. There is no, uh, uh, there is no gold. There is no uh, uh, American dollars to save your financiers in. So savings and investment are identical. There is no gap between what you save, what you invest. You do not consume. You separate some seeds, and you throw them uh, on ground. That's the whole economic activity as far as saving and investment goes. I'm going to underline this saving investment thing. I typically, a thousand times in this course, because this is the origin of macroeconomics. My colleagues do not uh, have this uh, uh, idea. For many of them, savings and investment are uh, identical because they are in the neoclassical tradition. The interest rate always equilibrates flow of funds, fun, uh, funds market, loanable funds market. Interest rate is resolved in the funds market, bringing saving and investment together. Uh, I have doubts about this tradition. On the other hand, uh, households save, uh, entrepreneurs invest, and the savings and investment do not necessarily come into equilibrium due to changes in the interest rate. Because interest rate is, do you remember this sentence? It's the opportunity cost of holding money. There is a liquidity, liquidity trap, liquidity this, liquidity expectations, and so on and so forth. Uh, when I give a, uh, what's giving Econ 102 in the uh, 23rd chapter of the book that we were using, money, money and banking, and we were just banging on the door. Uh, interest rate is the opportunity cost of holding money. Interest rate is the opportunity cost of holding money, which means that interest rate is determined in the money market. 
not necessarily in the savings investment market. Money, demand for money, supply for money. That's an entirely different tradition. The whole issue is, does saving funds suffice, is it, are they sufficient to bring investment demand into equilibrium? That's the origin of economics. You can assume that problem away, as in a neoclassical world, or you can make a big deal out of it, unemployment, uh, depression, uh, inflation, inflationary gap, depressionary gap, multiplier, da da da da da da da but you have to just be on a different train. So in this economy, one good solves all of these problems, but they are implicitly problems to be solved in our profession. Whenever uh, you are in an uh, analytical framework, one thing you have to always keep in mind, how is saving investment gap uh, closed? What is the adjustment mechanism that closes saving and investment gap? In Turkey, until very recently, foreign exchange flows, hot money, current account deficit financing was the mechanism filling these uh, together. Right now, we cannot have foreign borrowing flows due to various reasons. Uh, but the adjustment mechanism is happening through 46% uh, uh, of uh, producer prices. Some adjustment mechanism has to, uh, has to work. But the whole problem is this equilibrium. Okay, end of appendix. Now, back to uh, this equation. The growth rate is coming from seeds operation. Seeds saved, invested. Seeds saved, invested. As you put more seeds, you grow fast. But that means you eat less. And also there is a little V here for accounting purposes. That is the capital output ratio. And as you will recall, this uh, way of working uh, things is dated in a kind of a strange way. What I invest this year is actually capital will be called by an economist capital next year. Why don't we just call everything investment and forget about KT plus one, KT plus two? Well, uh, uh, come on, we are uh, colorful people. Uh, uh, we, we, we like, I mean, this is the land of uh, legends, uh, the Homer, Herodot, uh, the mythology. And so uh, we like to work with uh, terms. But in essence, capital stock next year is investment this year. All right, this is one equation. This is one unit of production is either consumed or invested. Then we have a, let me take this thing out of my way. We have also another constraint, which says that the value of one unit of corn, which is one, has to cover wage costs and profits. There is no other land rents. There is no interest payments. There is no debt uh, servicing. There is no foreign exchange uh, borrowing requirements or anything. I assume everything away. Labor and capital costs are only two types of the costs. Wages and profits exhaust the value of one unit of corn. V, capital output ratio, L, labor output ratio, wage rate, and the profit rate. I'm going to say more about this one plus R. Again, uh, you have to be very precise about what is a net profit rate and what is a gross profit rate. What's the difference between net and gross? Gross domestic product versus net domestic product. Gross investment, net investment. Hadi? Uh, I, I couldn't get you. Okay, what do we call that loss? Terrific, good idea, but. Uh, Depreciation, depreciation, that's uh, uh, so uh, <clears throat> if you are, if you have to recover 
the depreciation loss, the loss in capital from one year to other year. Then uh, as the capital owner, you have to get a return for it, right? Otherwise, why should you just uh, invest? So uh, what we mean as gross profits is total profits where the uh, owner of the capital stock earns profits and uses some of these profits to recover wear and tear, the depreciation of its capital. It has to be waxed, it has to be painted, it has to be lubricated, it has to be attended. Uh, but it doesn't add to your profits, but you have to do it. Otherwise, your, uh, your capital will be uh, worn out. So this one takes care of it. I'm going to come to it when we are uh, really working uh, with the model. And R is the net profit rate. These vultures, these Kanemiji uh, Vampiller, uh, the, the big capitalists, they are simply sitting in their uh, doors just for the basis that they own capital and they have thrown a couple of seeds to the ground the previous year. Without any toil or labor, they are simply grasping our units of corn. Okay. Now, as you will find out, R will go to zero because there will be competitive forces and so on and so forth. But uh, this doesn't change my attitude against uh, this economy. All right, so this is gross profit rate. R is the net profit rate. That is profits net of depreciation costs. Starting in two weeks, this will be an important component to keep track of in uh, accounting terms. And V is capital output ratio. Now what we had done is uh, I have equated these one and one together. I have uh, uh, solved uh, a couple of relationships. And we came out with the idea that the difference between W and C is OK. V over L, all right. And G minus R, right? Did I get it right? Yes. OK. <laughs> Look, this equation, a very simple relationship, but uh, suggests something very interesting from the point of view of how the society is organized and how this economy is uh, working along this organization. That's the institutions of this economy is embedded here. Look what, does, what it says. V over L is a, sun, is a bunch of parameters. I don't have to deal with this. If V is high, all it says that it's a capital intensive economy. If L is high, that is labor output ratio is high, that means that you use a lot of labor per unit of court. But since there is full employment, uh, that doesn't mean much. So I am I'm not making any deal out of the size of V versus L. It's a technological parameter relationship. Nothing uh, of interest for us for the moment. So forgetting about this thing, you see, if there is a difference between W and C, then uh, the, the difference between G and R, R is almost proportional to each other. And the classical economists, or the birth of our pr profession, since then, coming all the way to today, had made this assumption that if you call someone worker, it must be a worker. If you call someone a capitalist, it must work as a capitalist. Meaning that if workers are receiving a wage rate, then these wages must be exactly equal to the amount of consumption per person. That is what C is, little c is. And uh, at the background, especially in Ricardo and in Marx, this consumption is typically taken as subsistence level of consumption. What is subsistence? 
Just barely enough. Geçimlik. Geçimlik düzey. What's the subsistence basket in, uh, in Turkey? Typically uh, two loaves of bread, one uh, uh, uh, salcum of uh, grapes, two Marlboros, packs. Uh, uh, uh, uh, that's typical. Uh, <coughs> it kind of resembles the minimum wage basket, uh, which is 16 uh, or three Turkish liras in Turkey for the moment. But that is driven to the subsistence wage rate. Because there is, unemployment, uh, there is no unemployment, and the all uh, labor force has to meet the uh, demand for labor, therefore wages are driven to minimum consumption basket. And this leaves us with uh, two equations of this sort then. On this axis, we have R, and over here, we have G. If W is equal to C, then it means that the growth rate of investment is equal to the pro net profit rate in this economy. So if you plot this function, that is growth rate of investment and it, as I had been underlining uh, uh, uh, once more, investment and savings are synonymous. So this is almost like a savings function in profit rate. The way we regard this as it's a function of the profit rate that we call savings function. And the function is simply G is, G is equal to R. But implicitly, as I said, behaviorally, the way as an economist we interpret this G is equal to R, uh, or this uh, 45 degree line, as if it is a savings behavioral function of this economy, of the capitalists, in, uh, to be precise, where the function is simply G is equal to R. It is not only a... Uh, a relationship. It is actually a behavioral function. That uh, in economics we distinguish as the classical saving function. And this classical saving function has checks and boundaries. First of all, uh, Uh, it has a maximum because R has a maximum. R is at its maximum here if W is zero. You are simply using slaves. You do not pay any wages. All unit uh, one minus one plus R uh, over V is going to the capital owner. That's a slave economy. In, uh, theoretically, uh, there is an upper bound. Therefore, it gives a maximum on the growth rate. And the minimum is minus 1, where R is at its minimum. And that's where W is 1. Workers take all corn production and uh, R falls to minus one. So uh, this is where this uh, function uh, resides. So in this framework, <coughs> these two equations are related to each other. The net profit rate assumes a value between minus 1 and then a R max, depending on how W is resolved. And uh, I concluded uh, last week's uh, uh, session, uh, I mean uh, last Monday's uh, session, the, the last hour, 
by saying that uh, I have here four unknowns. Remember this, uh, this uh, story. That I have to add now uh, behavioral assumptions. And one method was to treat as a neoclassical economist. And neoclassicals will simply say that this output corn uh, that I have denoted x is being produced by capital and labor along a production function. And they have said that wage rate is the derivative of this function with respect to L. And the way it happens is that first output is produced, then Pro, uh, factors are paid their wages and profits. Technology and uh, production is resolved first. Distribution of that output is found out later. That's a sequence of events. Uh, technology and production Resolved first, distribution later. This is the neoclassical framework. On the other hand, Marxian framework argues that historically there is a class struggle and antagonism going on. And these historical conditions, one way or another, resolve and set the wage rate as given. So distribution is known prior to production. Before production, the workers know how much they are going to be paid. Then they go and start production, and seeds and investment all follows later. So in Marx, in Marxian analysis, Distribution is resolved, profit rate and uh, the uh, wage rate is uh, uh, resolved first. Then production and investment follows. Then we have another. Uh, uh, school of thought which kind of formulate what's happening as not first this then that but as simultaneously and the way it happens is uh, the neo keynesian or keynesian neo ricardian school This is somewhat uh, surprisingly simple, and you had been using this without really uh, being aware of the fact that it is part of a very key hypothesis of the neo Ricardian Keynesian school. And it is this idea. Rather than, rather than adding a production function, which says, if you use capital and labor together uh, with alphas, betas, uh, elasticity, so on and so forth, we produce. Rather than using a production function, we can use an investment function, an independent investment function. Introduce an investment function. So now you see that in this economy, we have already a savings function defined. Simple, but as I've been underlying, there is a saving behavioral function. G is equal to R. Simple, I admit, but it's a savings function. And up until now, both these two characters, neoclassicals and Marxians, were content with that. But now we are saying that, wait a minute, savings is another functional relationship. There are entrepreneurs driven by 
animal spirits, prophets, vultures, lust, love, uh, uh, that they are in a constant need for accumulation and uh, finding out a new area to make and expand profits. This guy is restless. Uh, uh, they are driven by, uh, as in Keynesian terms, animal spirits. They behave uh, like uh, vultures. Uh, they smell uh, profits. Okay? Uh, blood is just uh, so. Uh, so they they are driven by expected profits. So you may simply uh, write a functional form investment. I'm just using. Uh, let me write a function f of expected profits, uh, expected market share. The guy might, may be saying that, look, uh, I will own the whole cornfields. Uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, expected corn production. And any other thing that you can think of over here, just like we have fancy production functions, k to the alpha, l to the square root of this and that, you may come up with uh, uh, empirically validated investment functions. But what it does is if there is an investment function separately, then this function, i, will be bring into equilibrium with this function, s of r. And whatever inside these functional forms has to adjust. If you are writing a saving function as a function of r, and uh, if you are writing an investment function as a function of r, then the net profit rate will adjust and bring equilibrium there. You can be more innovative. You may say that, well, uh, I can put here expected output or employment or uh, the unemployment rate or capacity utilization, market share. So whatever you put here, in order to bring this equilibrium, they have to come into uh, play. Wages are given separately in Marx, but now they cannot be a separate entity. It will depend on the animal spirits of the investment function. So everything has to be resolved simultaneously. And we will do exercises on this. It's a different mentality. Up until now, have you ever used an independent investment function in your career since you came to Birkent? İyi düşünün. Econ 102. Birkent'teki akademik yaşantınız boyunca herhangi bir zaman bağımsız bir yatırım fonksiyonu kullandınız mı? Basit olabilir. Do not think uh, big things. Have you ever used an exogenous investment i is equal to 500 and then calculated the multiplier, the expenditure multiplier, the 45 degree line. Remember that sort of a deity? On the aggregate expenditure model. In the aggregate expenditure model, C plus I plus G plus X plus M, C was a function of marginal propensity to consume, C, MPC times Y, etc., etc. One minus taxes, if you want to add. How was I determined? Was it equal to automatically equal to savings? No, you said that I is, uh, let's say, X percent of GDP, or it is. 100 billion Turkish liras, and it is like that. It's exogenous investment. That is particularly a Keynesian analysis. Simple. You were, uh, you were kids back then, uh, not like uh, heroes of the Birkent economics uh, uh, like now. Uh, so it was a simple idea, but the idea was that you have uh, using an investment function Simple. It, this is also simple, but the fact that it's a simple uh, uh, model doesn't change the fact that it's an investment function separately on its own. So uh, right now you are aware that in a, 
in that particular chapter of your book, or when you are uh, trying to solve the, uh, a couple of homeworks and preparing for the first midterm in Econ 102, uh, Refetoja throwing out data, uh, I don't know, his compatriots, uh, uh, either Burchin or uh, Bilinoja or someone uh, uh, was just banging on your heads, a lot of data. But the background is the fact that investment was out there. So three different schools of thought on average, looking at this simple economy from different perspectives. Neoclassicals, what we had learned in the second year intermediate courses, they have taken a marginal productivity driven route to calculate wages and uh, profits. And marginal productivity is a technical term of what you do, we simply take a derivative and set it equal to the wage rate. The derivative of the production function with respect to L, that is the the extra contribution of the last unit of labor to output. That is the <coughs> tangency of, or the slope of the tangent to the production function. All fancy things that you were trying to find the tangency, etc., and uh, trying to find the uh, calculus. But the background idea is that whatever the, the worker is contributing to output, at the margin is his or her wage rate. How do you like this idea? What does it say? This thing. Imagine, again, in your eyes, uh, output is over, production is over. And the workers are coming with uh, uh, baskets full of corn. And look, you look at each worker and say that your marginal productivity to the overall production process today is, let's say, five units of corn. That's your contribution. And here is your wage rate, right? Marginal product is equal to the wage rate. Good. Exactly. The, this is, this cannot be a fairer distribution than all. Uh, no, not the communal. It's completely individualistic. We look at individual by individual. Every marginal product is the person's wage rate. But here, you are on the right track if I, if I haven't uh, mistaken. All labor is regarded homogeneous. So there are no skilled labor versus unskilled labor. There are no tall guys versus uh, uh, uneducated guys educated. So what you have said in communal terms is true, but there is, the community is exactly the same. I haven't distinguished between agricultural labor who is good at experts in corn picking versus uh, industrial labor which doesn't exist. I have only made a distinction between workers and capitalists as a group. But if you had, had something else uh, in mind? Uh, uh, I would like to say, so everyone is not producing the same amount of rights. Here, here, yes, because I haven't told that mechanism. I mean, in this bunch of equations, there is only one type of labor output ratio. But uh, uh, in the real life, there is, definitely. Uh, but in terms of fairness, this is an ideal, harmonious, fair society where there can be no explanation of exploitation. What is exploitation? You are not paid what you had contributed. To. You are unpaid. So in neoclassical economics, there is no idea of exploitation or just, fair, unfair. Well, uh, uh, what are these uh, uh, words for? If you are paid your marginal product, that's what you had contributed and that you must deserve for it. 
This, of course, does not mean anything in terms of real life, where there is opportunity cost of education and things of that sort enter the picture. But from the main essence, this is where the neoclassical economics is stemming from. On the other hand, the Marxians, well, uh, this thing could be low, high, brutal. Uh, it is the beginning of the story of exploitation in a capitalist society. That's why Marx needed a historically determined wages out of social relations and did not buy any of this idea of marginal productivity. Good. That it, you mean uh, you mean a disequilibrium yeah. by incompetent? Is that what you want to say? Disequilibrium. Very good point. That is true. Uh, that is true. But uh, under capitalist relations. Uh, Czech Republic or, or Czechoslovakia was under different uh, formation. Under capitalist conditions, that's why the classicals came up with this idea that due to pressure of unemployment, that the wages will be driven all the way down to subsistence level of consumption. So this complements the thing. But the Soviet system, the Checks, the, the Soviet republics, etc., was uh, another thing because that's quote unquote was not under capitalist mode of uh, production and distribution. Uh, the implicit idea that competition will force wages to consumption level of subsistence and will force the net profit rates to zero. There are competition on both sides. Good. Offering that um, marginal productivity of labor is equal to what the labor will get, is it, um, isn't it impossible? I mean, <clears throat> as the minimum wage, we can. It is much, much lower than uh, what could be. Could be. Could be. I mean, yeah. uh, I again. Well, uh, theoretically speaking, you have to adhere one of these three schools of thought in setting down wage rate and the profit rate. You cannot work with a state of mind or the model, technically, where you assume you introduce an independent investment function and also use marginal product driven wage and profit rates. These two will not work together. The profit rate and the wage rate that, you, that comes out from this operation will have nothing to do with the marginal product of the wage rate. You cannot impose both. The model will, will be overdetermined. It will not work. So you have to choose. And uh, at the outset, I don't have uh, any bias in terms of theoretical elegance in any of these main streams of thought. The only way is situations, data, which theory picks up the empirical data better, tries to explain. And this could be uh, uh, subject to cases. There, is no, there may not be a universally correct answer. It could be country specific, history specific, so on and so forth. But at the outset, none of these broad schools of thought in terms of theory, have inferiority or superiority. That's simply different hypotheses. You may find this unrealistic. That's where you rank the, the theories. And you just say that, well, this doesn't fit the facts, facts as the Czechoslovakian example, uh, uh, for example, provides. OK? So what we shall do? Starting next week, I am going to introduce, uh, we are not going to give, I'm just going to spend five or 10 minutes on the homework, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it will be quick. Uh, 
Uh, we are going to start with the neoclassical model based on these grounds. And this relationship, or the marginal product of capital rather than labor, will drive the whole neoclassical system. And then we are going to look at the Ricardian system, introduce the investment function, so on and so forth. And also, we are going to uh, uh, go to the Marxian model and then uh, look at the empirical data. Have the first midterm. Midterm. First, uh, there is one midterm. There is no second, first, etc. And then we are going to switch to endogenous growth and uh, institutionalize and uh, uh, change. Uh, the, these parameters will be all variables of this sort. But uh, in terms of how this thing may operate, if this is a saving function, and if I happen to have an investment function, something like this, investment is a function, all of a sudden, equilibrium is found right over here. See, that's the simultaneity I am mentioning. Production and growth and distribution. Simultaneously found out. That's how the Keynesian economy works. Now, uh, for uh, in a couple of minutes, let me uh, highlight the basics of the homework. And tomorrow, Gökberg will uh, go over it. And on, if you have uh, any uh, further concerns or uh, uh, uneasiness, we can always go together. Uh,